Buffalo Bills safety Damar Hamlin has become a household name over the last month. The nation, of course, has followed his story since his on-field scare in Cincinnati. Part of that centers on the response that was shown for a cause that is so close to Hamlin's heart. Sports director Matt Bove reports on the high honor Hamlin just received today. Yeah, the Allen Page Community Award is the highest honor anybody in the NFLPA can receive. And earlier today, that was given to Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin for all of his work with the Chasing M's Foundation. Now, of course, that all came into the spotlight after his injury at the beginning of the year. But even since he was released from the hospital, the work has continued and millions and millions of dollars have been raised. One of my favorite quotes, it's a blessing to be a blessing. Um, with that being said, I plan to never take this position for granted and always have an urgent approach in making a, a difference in the community where I come from and also communities across the world. Now the award, obviously a very big honor. It also comes with a $100,000 donation. So add that on top of the millions that have already been raised for the Chasing Ems Foundation. We also heard today from NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. He seemed overall pretty happy with the response, especially given the circumstances on January 2nd in Cincinnati. Reporting in the newsroom, Matt Bovee, 7 Sports. Yeah, it's great to see him doing so well, Matt. Thank you for that. Well, the family of a young woman who survived a major scare now says she has suffered a setback in her recovery. 18-year-old Gabby Kranick is paralyzed from the shoulders down. She was struck by a suspected drunk driver in Cattaraugus County back in September. Gabby's family posted earlier this week that she's back in intensive care and on a ventilator. On WKVW.com, you can see the show of support. Gabby's friends and neighbors have shown, and we also have a link to an online fundraiser to help the family. A demolition debate that has lingered for years has taken yet another turn. The owners of the old Volkers bowling alley have been trying to take the building down to make room for new development. Preservationists have blocked demolition. They cite the building's role in local history. Jocelyn Person today reporting on the latest step in this saga. There are many questions whether or not that the Volgers Bowling Alley building will be demolished because it has to get approved by the City of Buffalo's Inspection Department. The Buffalo Housing Court ordered a demolition to take down the Volgers Bowling Alley on Amherst Street. The question mark is not will it be demolished, but when will it be demolished? Councilman Joe Glombeck, who represents the North District, is looking for answers on what's going to happen to this historic building. A parking lot or a pile of rubble, I'm, I'm not going on the record to be supportive of it. However, if they're willing to build something here that enhances the neighborhood, that is historically significant or respects our historical significance of this corner, I could be supportive of them coming in here and doing that. Golombek tells me the key to all of this is for the owners of the building to send a site plan to the city's permit and inspection department. I spoke to Commissioner Amder from the inspections department and uh, she told me that the requirement of the property owner is to submit a site plan uh, to the city of Buffalo, what are they going to do here if this property gets torn down? I reached out to the department and I was told in a statement the next step for 680 Amherst is for the owner to submit a site plan for a new building to the city planning board. Yet Councilman Gwombeck did say he's all for saving a piece of Buffalo's history. It's the 6% of the building, in my opinion, that is worthy of preservation. The question is, is that can you save it without the, remain, without the remainder of the building and would it fall down, would it end up being an albatross? That's the concern that I have. I was unable to reach the owner of Volgers for a comment. Jocelyn Person, 7 News. Well, tonight we are taking an in-depth look into a potential change in how you make dinner or heat your home. Governor Kathy Hochul wants New York State to phase out natural gas. Yeah, very controversial. A priority, though, in her state budget plan. Taylor Epps has been looking into some of the questions about this proposal and separating fact from fiction. Taylor. Well, Jeff and Leah, change is scary, right? We're talking about a future where natural gas could be a thing of the past. 
and making the switch to electric isn't necessarily easy. So we want to break it all down for you. We're not going cold turkey here. This is a 400 page plan with a slow phase in. Now many want to know how will this work? There's been a lot of opposition to this. The concerns really come down to three R's regional differences, rates and reliability in a place like Western New York, where we rely on natural gas to heat our homes during the winter months. Can we rely on electricity? Now what's going to happen to my gas appliances? So we took those concerns to the head of New York's Energy Research and Development Authority or NYSERDA to get you those answers. I think it's important to note that this is a transition that is not happening tomorrow. And Buffalo is different for sure than is Syracuse, than is Albany, than is New York City, than is Long Island, et cetera. And that's why this plan really needs to lay out and it does um, approaches that are specific to our geographies, to our climates, which differ um, by those geographies and by the people um, within those. Now, the first major deadline here is 2025. That's when all new construction for low rise buildings in New York State going to have to be all electric inside. But there are so many more deadlines, questions and concerns. I'm going to go in depth on how this will work and what this means for you tonight at six. I'm looking forward to it. This impacts a lot of people, mm -hmm. whether whether Absolutely. it's your heating unit at home, your furnace or your gas stove. There's people cooking on it right now as they watch exactly. us for sure. So, so a lot of interest, right. a lot of all questions right. there. Thank, Thank you, you so too. much. Also tonight at 6, Bridge Blackout. Viewers asking us why the lights are off on Grand Island. Why some say safety on the roads is not their only concern. And up next, state silence. President Biden spoke to Congress for more than an hour last night. Two things one local congressman says he did not hear in all of that time. Plus, learning accountability, the crash course some students are getting and what it takes to make it in media. Time now is 510 and you are watching 7 News at 5. You're watching 7 News at 5 with Jeff Russo, Leah Lando, and 7 weather meteorologist Mary Beth Robal. Well, President Joe Biden has taken his State of the Union message on the road a day after he delivered it to Congress, and he already appears to have his eye on next year's election. President Biden began what the White House calls a nationwide blitz today in Wisconsin. He won that state by less than 1% in 2020. The president telling employees at a labor training center his policies are bringing the economy back. Why in God's name would America give up the progress we made for the chaos they're suggesting? Republicans claiming the president lied about the economy and debt limit negotiations during the State of the Union. One local lawmaker also said he was disappointed by what he did not hear. Tonight, we didn't hear nearly enough about the southern border, the crisis that's raging, and, and I think far uh, too little discussion of what we saw last week uh, with the spy balloon over this country from China. A lot of false rhetoric from the president talking, talking uh, tough and celebrating his position. But, you know, China's eating our lunch and we have to get tough about it. That's Congressman Nick Langworthy speaking with our partners at Newsy. Students in one local school receiving a lesson in accountability and responsibility. In fact, they're learning about journalism and the deadlines they must meet. Senior reporter Eileen Buckley went to Lackawanna to explore their work. You're in charge of the sale. Students at Global Concepts Charter School enrolled in this digital media journalism class were given a task as part of a lesson in accountability. They were handed one sheet of paper, a bowl, a straw, scissors, and a hole punch, and asked to build a sailboat with their team. If someone does not complete their, their portion of this, then the project fails. Literacy specialist and former journalist Spencer Lee tells me the lesson was his idea as he co-teaches with digital media teacher Stacy Klimzak. If they understand accountability and taking responsibility and then apply that into their life, not only will they treat people better, but at the same time, they'll actually be more employable. Their listening skills have gotten better. Their writing skills have gotten better. Uh, the way they talk to other people and they communicate with people, they, that's gotten better. This small group of students started writing a monthly newsletter, The Global Compass, for the school community last fall. They actually make those decisions on what stories they want to cover. And they write the story and they just literally go through all the steps and we try, we try to hit our deadlines.
And once students complete work on their news stories, this is the area in the school where they work together with teachers to help build that newsletter. I sat down with student Logan Rivera, who's in his second year at the charter school, and tells me the lessons from this journalism class are really helping him. Try to schedule things so that, you know, you're not unprepared. So also I think it like goes with life, it helps you with like life things. Rivera says his passion in the journalism class is in video photography, and he showed me some of his work shooting his school's basketball team. Creativity and like time management and stuff like that, and you know I'll properly write a you know good article. Students say the big challenge of being a high school student is time management, and this class delivers the lessons to work responsibly. Eileen Buckley, Seven News, Lackawanna. Want to learn about journalism? Eileen Buckley, not a bad place to start a Hall of Famer. Absolutely. So yes. happy to have I her. I learn here. a lot from her. Yes, we do. All right, the senior class at another local school took time out of the classroom to help fulfill the dream of a Buffalo Bills super fat. Seniors at St. Mary's High School spent the day at the teacher's desk for a day of caring. They assembled poncho packs. That was the mission of Ezra Poncho Bilia Castro until he passed away in 2019. It teaches you about um, the needs of the community and it teaches you how to be a better person and just overall like helping people out and just giving your time and it really it makes you feel special inside. The other teacher says projects like this push students towards a life of service to their community. Great lessons there mm -hmm. for those young folks today and Pancho Villa of course a big name in these parts, and his mission continues, for Always sure. Always fun to learn. We're learning every day, I think, right? Yes, yes. We have been advertising the high wind watch for tomorrow night going into Friday. Well, that has now just been elevated to a high wind warning, which means that it's very, very likely to happen. How these, high are we talking uh, here? We're talking that? about potentially damaging wind gusts up to 60 miles Oof. per hour. It looks like the worst of the winds will come late Thursday night going into the overnight hours. So uh, most of Western New York is in this, and it's in effect from 7 p.m. Thursday till 7 a.m. Friday. Sustained winds could be 30 to 40 miles an hour, and again, the winds gusting close to 60, and really applies to the shoreline area and also into the portions of the Genesee Valley as well. Uh, so we could have some damaging wind gusts, maybe some downed trees, power lines, maybe some scattered power outages too. And uh, be careful if you have a high profile vehicle, take it easy on the roadways uh, tomorrow night going into early Friday. Tonight, it's gonna be quiet, it's gonna be chilly. So if you're heading out, grab the heavier jacket. We have a cold breeze out there. It's not too windy, but any wind makes it feel a lot colder. We're gonna be dropping down into the low 30s. Currently, we're in the upper 30s. It's 38 degrees at Buffalo, 39 in the Falls, 40 at Middleport, Batavia. We're at 40 degrees for Jamestown, upper 30s at Ole and mid 40s at Wellsville. So we enjoyed a beautiful sun filled day, but now the clouds are pushing in from the south and from the west. It is a storm system that's going to bring us the rain, the warm air and the wind and it's coming in out of Texas. It's a fast mover, so it's going to take over as we get into tomorrow morning. So uh, when you walk out the door, you're going to need the rain gear and the umbrella too. Uh, not too windy in the morning, but a lot of rain, widespread rain for the morning commute. So roads will be very, very wet going into the lunchtime.